well, uh, even up prepared for uh, a hard approach to a soft uh, subject. Uh, it's evidence-based happiness, evidence-based pursuit of happiness. And now you may first wonder uh, what the hell happiness is, what the pursuit of happiness is, and uh, what evidence-based pursuit is. Well, uh, let's start with happiness. I take happiness as satisfaction with life, and with your life as a whole. And so happiness is not the same as feeling good at the moment. And possibly there are some people here who are not too satisfied with their life as a whole, but still have a good moment. And there are also people um, uh, who are satisfied with their life, but had a too wild party yesterday and now feel miserable. So we're talking about life satisfaction, eh? happiness as life satisfaction. And that's actually something that most people want. Eh? Only a few weird philosophers say they don't like that. So, and that's universal. Eh? We are programmed to want to have a, a, a satisfying life. But that's different from pursuing a satisfying life. Eh? Because you pursue it only if you deem it possible. Well, and if you live in a miserable society, eh, as most uh, of our forefathers did in the Middle Ages, well, then you know happiness is not possible on earth, and you don't really try to. But we live in a better condition. Eh? We live in a multiple choice society, um, and we live in a happy society. We know that happiness is possible, and we can choose our life, uh, we can choose our uh, occupation, we can choose whether to marry or not, or to have children or not. And when you can choose, yes, then you can make an optimal choice in order to get happier. How to pursue happiness? Well, if you want to get happier than you are, uh, you must know what makes you happy. Well, and there's a lot of beliefs about what makes you happy. Uh, there is beliefs about the kind of society that makes you happy, and there is beliefs about the lifestyle that is most likely to make you happy. And um, when we go to what kind of society is the most happy, and uh, then when I studied sociology in the 1960s, uh, most of my fellow students thought that well, in Western capitalist society, you can be happy in socialism, yes. And look, hey, there was the promise of happiness in China. And a lot of my fellow students also had pictures of Che Guevara um, in their student room. Well, later it appeared that the Chinese were not too happy and neither were the people in Cuba after the communists uh, take over. So, we now realize that this belief was false. Still today, there are other beliefs. And a popular belief is that happiness is not in the outside world, but happiness is deep in yourself and your true self, and if you disengage from the world and concentrate on your true well-being, then the angels start singing. <laughs> well, maybe that produces a moment of bliss, but uh, certainly not uh, satisfaction with life. At least not for the average person. And there have a lot of uh, experiments been done and with uh, people uh, taking meditation courses and then following up uh, whether they really got happier. And most of these studies were never published. Why? Because they didn't find any result. Now I'm talking about research already. And indeed, there is research on happiness. And there is a new science of happiness well, which started in the 1970s and came to flourish since the uh, year 2000. And in this strand of research, uh, happiness is measured using self-reports. Yeah? And that's well possible, because if you define happiness 
as how much you like your life, well, then the best way to measure that is ask people how much they like their life. And once you do that, and you know how happy people are, well, then you can compare across places. Eh? How happy are they in China and in the US? You can compare over time. Eh? Uh, were people happier uh, in the last generation or, or now? And you can also compare different kinds of people. And if you compare, you can also grasp at the causes and eh, what finally determines your happiness. Well, here you see a simple question on happiness. Taking all together, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? And it's actually the definition of happiness. Well, if you're very dissatisfied, you say one. If you're very satisfied, you say ten. Very simple. And because it's so simple, this question has been used several million times in surveys all over the world. It has also been used in a general population survey in the Netherlands. And here you see the results. Uh, some 5% scores 10, uh, some 15% 9, 40% um, 8. Uh, so that is quite positive in the Netherlands. Still, you see on the left uh, that there are also people who uh, are unhappy. Um, Percent-wise, it's not very much, but they don't fit this room. Uh, it's still about 100,000 people. But the picture is positive. And if you have such a distribution, you know, uh, from the first class of statistics, you can compute an average. And if you do, uh, you see that, on average, uh, in the Netherlands, we score 7.8, which is quite good, but the Danes do a bit better. Uh, we beat the Americans, we are happier uh, than the Germans, we are also happier than the French. I guess in summer, when many people from the Netherlands go to France, that the average goes up a bit. <laughs> No surprise that people are not too happy uh, in Zimbabwe, or in Iraq, and in Zimbabwe, that's about uh, the worst possible. Well, here are a few averages. Now, of course, you want to see the rest of the world. Okay, here it is. Here is the map of happiness. And the darker the green, the happier the people are. And so Denmark, you see it, is very dark green, um, but the other Scandinavian countries are also quite happy, as is Iceland, even in spite of the banking crisis. Well, if you look at this map, and I remember my fellow students saying that capitalism was shit, uh, then you see that people are still pretty happy under capitalism. And they're also happy in countries um, that are democratic. And that's one of the reasons why the Russians are not too happy. What you don't see here in, on this map, but what proves to be the strongest predictor of average happiness in countries, that is bureaucracy. That is good civil servants, competent, not corrupt. And that's one of the reasons why these Scandinavian countries are so damned happy. And they have a well-organized society, and that society prov provides the individual the freedom to choose the way of life that fits him best. And in such societies, you're not too dependent on your clan uh, and, and your boss, uh, because there is a solid society behind you. Well, um, you see enormous differences in happiness here, and by now we can explain about three quarters of these differences in uh, characteristics I mentioned. But you, we would also like to know, especially you personally, what makes for the difference in happiness within countries. And so here we have the Netherlands, and, uh, well, most of you are seven or eight, 
And if you pursue happiness, you want to get to a 9 or 10. And what will promise a happier life for you? Well, would it be money? And most people believe that uh, money will make them happier, especially if uh, they don't work for it. Well, let's look at the data. And, well, here we see that, uh, well, the people who have the least income, uh, left bottom, uh, they are indeed less happy. But the richest are not the happiest. Actually, uh, people um, who uh, score in the seventh uh, decile of, of income uh, are the happiest, in this case, in Britain. And so apparently, um, well, some money is okay, but more money not always, certainly not if you have to work very much and uh, sacrifice your private life. Uh, so one belief uh, on the basis of data, uh, well, Mm, at least modified. Well, then another belief, it was already announced that, uh, well, what really makes you happy is children. Well, see them. And, um, well, uh, these people are very happy, they have a high, uh, literally. Um, but what do the data tell? Well, here you have a statistic, uh, a statistic of people followed 10 20 years, and to the left uh, 10 years before the marriage, uh, uh, to the right 10 years after the marriage, and um, the zero line is the moment of marriage. And there you see uh, the happiness of um, the people who got children. And look at the, 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 the black line. And there you can see that people who get children are initially uh, somewhat happier, than people who finally don't, and that they really have a high uh, during pregnancy and after birth, but then it goes down, <laughs> and not only for young parents, but also <laughs> the whole way <laughs> until children leave home. <laughs> uh, still, it's not too dramatic, because if you compare uh, the, the, the top and the bottom, well, that's half a point uh, on scale 0 to 10. Still, uh, the data show otherwise than uh, what most of us believe. And, um, yeah, why do I know this? Because there is now an enormous body of knowledge. And so here you see uh, in this graph the development of the scientific publications on happiness. Well, in the last point of my graph, in 2010, well, today and um, every year about 500 pu uh, publications. Well, that's a lot of data and it's difficult to organize that all. I do that in my World Database of Happiness and that is a findings archive and there you can f uh, search on subject and on people and on time and it's about 25,000 findings on happiness already there, uh, which looks like that you know everything, but if you compare it to research on health, it's peanuts. Still, I think that if we go on this way, if we gather facts on happiness and we use these facts, we will become more happy. Because we live in a multiple choice society and we have to make choices political and personal, and then you can better choice on the basis of established fact than on the basis of belief. And I think we can get happier. And actually, we already got a bit happier. And if you look at this graph, and where each dot is the average of responses of about 2,000 people in the Netherlands, you see that we already creep up and we are approaching the eight. Well, we can get further, because the average is 8.3 in Denmark. Possibly, and we can get an average of 8.5. And why do I think so? Well, 
that focusing on facts has also worked in the pursuit of better health. And that's what we call evidence-based medicine. And not too long ago, uh, medicine was also a matter of belief. And that people said, well, uh, if you pray, uh, you will get happier. Uh, or if you eat that special herb um, or dance in, in, in the morning, well, it all appeared to be bullshit. And a lot of uh, med science also appear to be bullshit. And gradually, we have selected the things that work. And that had an effect, because we live now much longer. And so um, over the last um, uh, 40 years, and there's a gain of uh, about 10 years more that we live, and that we live in good health. And that's not only in pills, uh, but it's also in the knowledge we build in preventive health care. Well, my point is that what, we, what worked in medicine can also work in happiness, and that we should invest more in happiness research. And I would say, call your politician, ask them to raise the taxes to pay for that. Thank you. <laughs>